Welcome to the Local Foods College. I'm Natalie Hoydel. Um, I'm a statewide extension educator working with vegetable growers. And I'm part of the team that coordinates the Local Foods College, which is through extension, through the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. So the Local Foods College has been happening for a number of years now. We do it every winter um, and usually focus on just a series of topics that relate to local foods. And this particular series is a rapid response to COVID-19. So we're doing a bunch of different topics um, that are related to this exact emergency moment and how we can respond. And then just a reminder, so we're kind of developing these sessions as we go. We're continuing to add more as people send questions and request new topics. So starting on Thursday, the Department of Agriculture and the Minnesota Grocers Association have been working together um, on a wholesale response. So if you have lost markets, due to COVID-19 related closures. They're gonna be talking about that and some of their efforts to reroute produce. Next week, um, Ren Olive and Kathy Drager from Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships are gonna be talking about their Farm to Rural Grocery Toolkit. The following Thursday, Rachel Armstrong from Farm Commons will be talking about employment concerns um, and just legal things that farmers should be thinking about. And then we've got more coming. So. Following this session, you're gonna get an evaluation. And if there are topics that you would really like us to do a session about, you can um, request them there. So today we are talking about crop planning and resilient business strategies in a time of uncertainty. Um, and this is in some ways, maybe one of the most open-ended um, webinars, just because we're, we're talking about uncertainty. We don't know what's gonna happen with markets. Um, and so Ryan Pesch and David Van Eckhout were two the two people that we thought of immediately to do this. Um, they're both really experienced farmers and also have some kind of community economics and marketing expertise as well. So Ryan um, is an extension educator. He's worked in community economic development for extension in West Central Minnesota since 2004. And he also runs, um, I think it's pronounced Lida Farm, <laughs> Ryan, you can correct me, um, in Otter Tail County. So a diversified vegetable farm there. And David Van Eckhout um, is the grower support specialist at the Good Acre. He began farming in 1998 on organic vegetable farms. Um, and after a couple of years, he and his wife, Melinda, started Hogs Back Farm in Western Wisconsin. He is now the Good Acre's grower support specialist. And so he combines his farming experience and his business knowledge to provide support to the Good Acre's farmers. And so with that, I'm gonna stop, stop sharing my screen and Ryan is gonna take over. Okay, this is good. So uh, Natalie asked me to do this and um, I'm a wordy person, but I have made a commitment to, to keep myself down to about 15 minutes. So if I shoot for 15 minutes, hopefully I clock in at 17, Natalie, okay? And you're going to cut me off if I go any longer. So we don't want to do that. Okay. Um, I did, uh, I came, I have no slides, but I came up with a, uh, look at things with a Sharpie. So this is my thinking as of today on this particular topic. And as Natalie pointed out, this is a topic that's very much in flux. It's also a topic that there can be very differing opinions here. Um, just to frame things up, I, I, wrote, I wrote up these ideas here to think about, number one is just a point of conversation to get us uh, talking about the things that we should think about. And number two, my audience in mind were my fellow growers, my fellow farm operators. Uh, and I think this stuff really applies whether you're a fruit or vegetable person or you're a livestock person but definitely if you're kind of a local food producer and marketing, um, direct marketing uh, to end customers, or if you're marketing to say a direct to retail or direct to grocery. So this is uh, one, one person's take on this thing as somebody who sort of thinks about the local foods market, especially uh, with my extension hat on, I do that kind of work, uh, but also with my experience as uh, Ryan Pesh, vegetable operator, uh, who's been, um, and I've kind of been at it now, uh, if you count my apprenticeship about about 20 years. So 
I sort of felt like this salty old sea captain. I <laughs> started thinking about it, or I'm getting to that point. I'm just 43, so I'm not totally there yet. Anyways, <clears throat> I have two slides, if you will. I got some, what I think are major points that, let me see. Okay, hold on, figure this out. Okay, this is, looks backwards to me if I'm looking at it. Does it look <laughs> somewhat right? Okay, uh, I'll hit like these three major points. Oh, Katrina says, yeah, I can kind of read that. My major points that I think are, are there to kind of uh, frame my thinking on this. And then I have a few point, point pieces, pieces of advice that I think um, all of us need to think through as operators. So, <clears throat> Brian's yeah. take so far. Before you ahead. start, yeah. I just want to recommend to people, if, if you're seeing all of the screens and Ryan's just a tiny box, yeah. hover your mouse over your screen and click speaker view, and then he'll expand so you'll be able to see him better. Mm. Just a little tip. Sorry. Okay. I just see myself as a gallery, like I'm with a whole bunch of other little people, Natalie. Is that right? I guess it doesn't matter. Oh, I can. It's good enough. Okay. So, uh, my main points. One, generally, I think that um, from my own experience uh, so far, and it's only been a month or whatever, a few weeks, I'm sort of seeing this uh, increased interest uh, in, in local foods and purchasing from local producers. Um, that's one man's experience here from West Central Minnesota. Certainly a, a number of new inquiries uh, for the CSA. And of those new inquiries, especially people I haven't uh, heard or met or talked to before in my life, there's this general sense of like, thank you for doing what you're doing. This is extremely important. I am happy to connect with you. Um, and I think uh, as somebody who's more of a marketing person in this world of local foods, um, I think it's given me some kind of insight, this conversation into what's in the minds of the customers, if you will. My own observations on this in terms, of, I think this interest is driven primarily by, um, by two things. One, there's this general reconsidering of our traditional supply chain, right? When our, our mainline supply chains essentially kind of grind to a halt after one week of panic buying, it sort of gets people to say, oh my goodness, um, are there alternatives? Is, boy, I didn't realize this system was that fragile. So it causes people to kind of maybe think a little bit differently about where their food is coming from, sort of discombobulated them to some degree. Also, I think, and this is something that I think we, we commonly see in times of recession, at times of economic stress or distress in general, is uh, this is a phrase I picked up from the last time we were in the Great Recession, this uh, refocus on hearth and home or home and hearth is something marketers like to think about. Um, and I do think that 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 is the case. I've certainly felt that. And I think in conversations with customers and others that that there is this kind of sense like we need to uh, reconsider our focus. We need to focus in on such things as food and shelter and family, right? There's this, that's that refocusing on hearth and home. Uh, let's, as a consumer, let's shed some of these other things and refocus. I think there's some of that going on. Generally, there's this, uh, people are involved in more alternative procurement than they have been. Uh, and I think this is, this is a trend, right? Everybody is now getting uh, acclimated to pickups and deliveries as opposed to their usual shopping routine, if you will, of going to a big box store, uh, shopping for groceries in something akin to an airplane hanger um, that's cheap and convenient and getting their stuff and going home. Um, now, even those airplane hangers are doing some pickups and deliveries, right? Uh, people are becoming more cultured and acclimated to online ordering in such a way. So again, I just feel like people are are, are now getting into this flow and getting used to um, ordering and procuring food differently. I don't know what the, the long-term impact of that will be, but that's certainly an experience that people are having. Um, you know, I think the upside in terms of local food producers is we've always been, like when I do a CSA, whether delivery and drop-off, it, it, it's so alternative to some people, it's like, I don't know, it's sort of out of my flow, if you will as a customer, it's out of my usual routine in a way that's like, I don't know, it just seems inconvenient. Well, right now, a lot of people are in this inconvenient flow. To what degree is that going to 
change their shopping habits or perspective on how uh, they shop and buy things? It's an open-ended question, I'd say, uh, but an observation. Uh, the other observation is there's a lot more online communication going on. Uh, and another thing, just if I put my economics hand, hat on, uh, just in terms of unemployment, recession, and economic slowdown, I think is another major factor that obviously we're in this very uh, short, is this, is this short term, is this long term? Uh, most people agree that, uh, yes, this is a great big hit to the economy and probably is going to have some very serious uh, ongoing effects, if you will. Um, and again, I, I go back to that hearth and home. That's something that we definitely saw in the world uh, when, it, when it came down to the Great Recession, um, 2008 and 2009. People did refocus on food in a certain way. We actually saw, at least in, 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 from my point of view, I saw a number of people get into the local foods movement to become entrepreneurs at about that same time because they themselves were focused on hearth and home or were in an unemployment situation and we're looking for a uh, small business to start up. And that's some, uh, some of those businesses stuck around from that time, some of them didn't, but there's definitely a trend there. So Ryan's thinking, things we should think about. Um, I had three of them. Like if I get more than three, everybody's gonna stop listening. <laughs> that's the idea. Um, so my, the way I'm thinking about things and the way I'm advised, I might advise other people uh, to uh, think about uh, selling in this time of COVID and in, in the near future. Um, one, and this is my mantra, people who know me know I'm always talking about this. People should really give some thought to how they are selling, not what, just what they're selling, but how they are selling. What are your current market channels and how are those market channels going to be impacted by these trends and, and changes in how people shop and are shopping now. So again, some of those things might stick, some of them might not, we don't know. Uh, but so for example, uh, uh, you know, I think a real primary question on a lot of people's mind is, okay, um, even if the farmer's market is an essential business, much like a grocery store, what will the appetite for people be to gather in, at a farmer's market the way they traditionally have? You know, we might be four months from now and it's all hunky-dory, no big deal, all right? Or there might be some lasting impacts, or there might be some percentage of people that, that, that won't or have gotten out of the habit of going to the market. We honestly don't know. But if I were, if my only market channel were a farmer's market, I would seriously at this time consider an alternative way to selling through that same farmer's market. I know Kathy Zeman was on here. And I've, I've worked some with the Farmer's Market Aggregation Project. And my goodness, when they took that tool of aggregating product that they have been doing for two years and now released it as a, a drive-through farmer's market, my goodness, did the Rochester Farmer's Market have some pickup and success. So here's an example of a farmer's market using a new tool, an online tool to aggregate sales uh, and doing it as a pickup and offering a pickup uh, as opposed to a traditional farmer's market um, format and worked very well at this particular time. Will it be necessary six months from now? I don't know. But I would certainly, if I were involved in a farmer's market, think about what is the alternative to our, how we're typically running our farmer's market. What else could we add on or do along a similar way so that we can continue to be as, uh, as open as we possibly can to as many people as we possibly can. In some respects, I sort of think that CSA, especially as people are getting different to different ways, uh, getting used to different ways of procuring foods, is almost like we're practicing people <laughs> uh, to, to do CSA, right? If you're used to doing, if you're not doing pickups at your grocery store, don't worry. You wanna do a CSA? It's pretty much the same pickup you've always been doing now that you're practicing. So. Uh, to some degree, I think this is something um, that people might have more appetite for. Um, and this issue about a farm stand, I certainly know that we certainly had a lot of uh, uptick in our farm stand uh, recently. And I do think with this uh, think, um, kind of refocusing on hearth and home, I think there's something about, I think there's something about the authenticity of a farm stand, regardless of this thing, that really sells uh, product. And I think in this refocus in terms of a hearth and home, 
this um, a farm stand is one way for people in a very uncrowded environment. My farm stand is not really crowded, I would say, uh, and in a very authentic way to offer up food to people on their terms. So uh, I, I do think of these two things as as um, fitting the bill uh, for the future. At least that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, regardless of how you change things, things you know the primary question is how do you keep those marketing costs low? Um, so, yep, I think CSA is gonna uh, work well. You might think about offering delivery for CSA, but I want you to recover those costs if you are going to deliver for CSA. Um, if that's something you haven't done, it might be something you would consider offering. Make sure that you're pricing it accordingly so that you're not going backwards <laughs> in your delivery. Again, people are very supportive of getting food directly from you, correct? Uh, just make sure that you're not going backwards in doing it. Uh, number two, I think there's something to be said about a change in a product mix. Uh, this is a product mix change that I saw with the Great Recession, and I think we might see it again, um, is uh, if there is an economic slowdown and um, there is greater unemployment, maybe uh, people are a little more cash strapped. In terms of focusing or making darn sure that we're long on the staples, that we offer some form of bulk. For example, the one thing that we did just the last couple of weeks are, we're, we're gonna do a little plant sale at the end of our driveway simply because we consistently have extra plants and all we did is bought some three and a half inch pots and, uh, and we'll be selling some plants off because I've had a lot more interest from just home gardeners on, hey, can I get some plants from you? Or, um, geez, can you give me some advice on gardening, Ryan? I'm a lot more into garden. I feel like I should garden this year, right? Again, that focus on hearth and home. Uh, and this is one that I could sort of uh, be of service by selling plants to people, as well as uh, get a different income stream, just a tiny little income stream. Lastly, three, I think there's, this, uh, there's a lot to be said about communication and, and, and how we can communicate. So if you're kind of old school and you're not um, communicating much online, um, we should figure that out. You should have figured it out six, seven years ago, but you really need to figure it out now. <laughs> um, one thing I did is I just posted on Facebook a question like, hey, um, I don't know, do you think there's gonna be, do you, do you think there's more interest for more local foods, folks? Uh, should I grow more this year? It was a, just an open question in my mind. Should I go long on what I grow this year or not? And I had a heck of a lot of response from that. And the overall response from existing and maybe future customers were like, go for it uh, because we have a real appetite for supporting local businesses at this time. And again, that, that sort of breakdown of the traditional supply chain is getting people, I think, to rethink of who they're sourcing from and want to make darn sure that there is a local source for food. And so they want to support that. And so I, uh, just by asking, I think one great thing is like we try to make it complicated, but you can actually just ask your customers, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. I'm thinking about adding delivery to our CSA. What do you think? Do you think that's necessary? Ask them. I hope if you've been in business a while, you have their email. Ask them, just ask, either call individuals up that you know fairly well, do it as a, a bulk email. Um, just open communication with your customers is almost always a good thing. Um, and more than likely you're not bothering them. Too often as Midwesterners, we think we're bothering people, but we're not. Uh, in many respects, I think your customers would probably appreciate hearing from you and giving their input. And lastly, in terms of communication, and this kind of goes along more with my brand, maybe more so than anything, I wrote down this thing here, hope, hope, right? I mean, people are kind of eh, sort of feeling a little weird, a um, little on edge. Um, I know it's been one part of, and I don't know if it's just my personality and how I communicate about our farm, but I really believe a lot in, you know, independent local farms as sort of being this uh, beacon of authenticity and hope uh, in this 21st century world, we're often kind of discombobulated. That's oftentimes an appeal uh, to local farms on the part of customers. Um, you know, this is like an honest to goodness farm family doing honest to goodness work, putting out an honest to goodness quality product. It's that simple, right? And so uh, 
I know I'm just going to continue that effort of really kind of showcasing. Um, I, I, you know, the way I primarily do that is through a weekly blog. I don't blog much in the off season. I need to blog a little more now, but I really try to get across um, kind of the, the, the day-to-day -day life of the farm. And I just sort of authentically try to talk about farm topics and topics that are kind of near and dear to my heart uh, in a way. And, and, and I really do think that there's something to be said about our uh, carrying on and, and doing well what we do well uh, actually will give people some sense of, of real hope in this time, regardless of what's currently ongoing. You know what? The farmers aren't falling down on their backs. You know, like I keep telling people when I see them, like, it, the plants aren't the plants aren't affected by COVID. You know, the season's going on. Uh, food will be raised, food will be delivered. You will be fed. You know, I think that's that's an important message that I'm going to be trying to convey because I think it's something that uh, people at this time uh, need to hear. So, uh, and so there's a lot of ways depending on how you typically communicate with your customers. You might want to think about how you can communicate some sense of that uh, in this time. Yes, Karen writes about if you're not a blogger, uh, showing farm life via Facebook or Instagram uh, is good. Yep, I, I do both of those things as well. <laughs> but uh, I like blogs because it's a longer form format. It's a way to kind of get across some of the nuance, if you will. Um, okay, Natalie, I'm probably, I'm probably at 15 minutes, right? Yeah, that was perfect. Thank you. Okay, there I did it. So now we're going to shift um, and David's going to take over. Um, and I think David does have a PowerPoint. And then we will have some discussion time at the end. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Uh, everybody hear me okay? I will assume so. Um, yeah, I think just the way Ryan uh, ended that up, I'm just going to second that notion that I think it's a really good time to think about while we're dealing with so much chaos and crisis management right now to think about why you started farming in the first place, you know, cause those reasons are all still there. We're all trying to make a difference in the food system and just reminding yourself that everything, you know, unfortunately the food system hasn't changed all that much since a lot of us got into farming, but, um, but it's really important not to lose sight of why you started doing it in the first place. And e even through all this crisis, you're still doing it for the same reasons. Okay, so I'm gonna um, share my screen here. And Ryan, you make me feel like a city slicker now with my slides. Uh, I don't usually do slides either, but. It's okay. Uh, you're good. You're good, Dave. It was a rainy day or a snowy day this morning, so I figure why not? Um, I, you know, I guess what I'll come at this a little differently is I'll come at it a little more from the urban um, as opposed to the rural. So most of the stuff when I'm talking about a grocery store, I'm talking about a bigger grocery store rather than a rural um, local grocery. You know, so some of those things are going to be different depending on the market, of course. And... You know, I, we'll touch on, I'll touch on a lot of the same things, but I guess it's hard for me to touch on any of this without at least starting out by talking about, um, you know, some of the challenges we have um, with all, all of who we are and what we're doing too, you know. So, I, I mean, I think it's really important in any of these discussions to just be talking about a, a self-check around mental health, how we're feeling mentally and physically during a really challenging time. You know, um, I think it, it, it's easy as, you know, <laughs> I think a lot of us as farmers have a tendency to just, you know, stuff it and keep going. And um, I think it's really important right now, especially because we all have to be isolated, that to try and reach out to people in ways that you maybe don't normally uh, to just get together with people and communicate, even if it's over these crazy technological systems. Um, I think also physical health is something I'm concerned about because I hear a number of farmers talking about how they're just going to try and do as much as they can before they bring on any employees. 
which could really, you know, in the short term, again, could be fine, but in the long term, it's not sustainable and really um, leads you to a, a situation where you could hurt yourself or overdo it. Um, those of you who are younger, maybe don't have to worry about this as much, but those of us who are a little more um, ripe in age, it, it, you, we just can't work like a 17 year old, you know? So I think just being aware of what your limits are, checking in with other people, um, and yeah, trying not to be socially isolated, even though we say social distancing, but I think it's, you know, I think that's, it's physical distancing more than anything, right? I don't think anyone's getting this from social closeness. Um, so that's the mental and physical health piece, which I'm totally unqualified to talk about too. So just uh, FYI, the financial health is something I think that, uh, all farms need to be thinking about, all small businesses, everybody needs to be thinking about. Um, I think it, luckily we got this extra time to file your taxes. I mean, a lot of you probably already done it yet since you're farmers um, or have already done it. But if you haven't, it's a good time to do it um, just so that you can start, you know, the season with your books up to date. Um, one thing that I've been working with a few people on and really encourage is developing a 13 week cash flow for your farm um, and for your household for that matter. I think when, when resources are tight and you're really trying to make, figure out how that money is gonna last, laying it all out on paper or on a Google sheet or whatever your preferred method of doing that is, is tremendously valuable. And I'm going to paste into the chat here a, uh, bear with me, I'm not super quick at this. I kind of lose my chat when I'm projecting here. <laughs> okay. So this is a, uh, a webinar uh, by Tara Johnson over at the Food Finance Institute and down in Madison of how to put together one of these 13 week cash flows. And I really encourage everyone to sit through it. She's also got um, at that same link, she's got a template that you can use. You can develop your own template. It's pretty simple. It's really just a way of putting out all of your um, all your inflows and your outflows, just to see where your cash is going, how much cash you need, just to kind of get a handle on everything, looking out for the next, in this case, you know, 13 weeks would be three months. You know, I, I would recommend even putting it out farther, at least until you know that your farm revenue is gonna start coming in from any seasonal sales. Um, it's also super helpful if you're a CSA to really get a handle on your numbers and make sure that like your the money that you're taking in now for your CSA shares is going to last. So um, it takes a little while to set up, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, and then just update it every week. Keep it updated. And it's it's tremendously valuable. I know we all spend a lot of time with spreadsheets, those of us who, you know, do our crop planning on spreadsheets or whatever. But um, I would just encourage you to experiment with it, try it out. And if you can, just consistently get in the habit of doing it. I think watching our expenses this time of year is stressful on, in, during any farm season. So watching them during a, a time like this where we don't necessarily know how our markets are doing is, is just, it's absolutely critical. And I don't know about you guys, but it, it takes a load off of me if I know when I'm paying something, when that money's coming in, if I can just plan all that out ahead of time. And we actually, I mean, we, I do one for my household. Um, I do one for the um, nonprofit that I work for. It's just, I, I, I'm kind of into them right now. So if you, if you get it started and you get stuck and don't understand how to do it, you can shoot me an email um, and I'm happy to help. And then also you might see as you lay out what those expenses of yours are gonna be, you might see opportunities there for um, putting some money in savings, um, maybe part of the stimulus that comes in, you don't need it right away. 
um, put it aside so that you have something set aside to take advantage, number one, of any opportunities that come up or any challenges. And I'm, I'm guessing that every farm out there is going to have opportunities and challenges this year. Uh, so market health is uh, something that Ryan talked a lot, a lot about. Um, I'm seeing the same thing in, in more of the urban market. Uh, of course, direct retail is way up. Um, it's gone crazy, really. Uh, anybody who had anything from last year, storage-wise, it, it flew off the shelves. And uh, people who still had CSA shares have been selling briskly if they didn't completely sell out. Um, that's great, but it's also, it makes me a little nervous. Will it last? You know, is this just a, a blip? Um, is this panic buying of local product just the way that people were panic buying other things in the stores? Um, I would love to think it's a shift, but I think we've, we've been through some other turbulent times like this, like um, the recession the, um, in 2008 that, that we saw some of this too. The same thing we're seeing with uh, seed companies and transplants invariably. People are going to put in their own gardens. Uh, it's really unknown how that's going to affect anything. Um, you know, direct retail, or not direct retail, but like grocery retail is up. Um, and that probably will continue since other parts of the markets are down. You know, I mean, if, if people aren't eating out, then grocery retail should stay up. Now, what, what some of the grocers are saying, though, is that they're really having to move away from bulk veggies because they don't want... Um, anybody handling things um, with their hands, any bulk greens like in the co-ops, they're moving away from uh, spinach in bulk or salad mix in bulk, all moving to package because they're not going to leave a tongs out to handle salad out of the thing that multiple people handle. Um, so that's something that we're seeing right now. And I'm guessing once that kind of trend really gets uh, cemented, it's not going to go away. So I, I, I do think packaging, unfortunately, is going to just continue its relentless pursuit of using as much plastic as humanly possible. Um, restaurants are down and boy, I don't know, I think that's the darkest cloud on the horizon. If you were someone who was really uh, selling strongly to restaurants, I just, I mean, those of you who know restaurants well know that they run really tight margins and are always on the edge as it is. It's going to be, we're going to lose a lot of restaurants that won't come back. And the restaurants that do come back will come back slowly. Um, so if I was someone who sold a lot to restaurants, I would definitely be looking at other markets right now. Cause I don't think 2020 is going to be the year to sell to restaurants. Um, food service is down and should probably come back a little faster but it's not we haven't found it to be a great source of any local product um in the markets that we work in it's been a heavy lifting so i don't think that's a real uh good opportunity for anybody but and plus we we're seeing food service companies pivot their businesses so that they start um actually doing some direct retail sales to customers. So there's a question there too of like, you know, whether it's Amazon or whether it's uh, Cisco or Sodexo, as those um, companies pivot to different business models, how is that going to affect any opportunities that local farms see? Um, and how much are people willing to go with a local farm if they have a big truck coming from somebody else that's going to their neighbors and going to the other people across the street. Um, I'm sure many of you saw the article that was in the New York Times over the weekend about how much food was getting destroyed on farms and milk getting dumped um, because of having this shift of markets go from institutional to grocery and retail. Um, it's been interesting to see uh, consumers' reaction to that, this, this period of 
shortages in local grocery stores. Meanwhile, farmers are dumping produce. Um, I think educating your customers around that when you're talking to customers is probably going to be important. Trying to figure out how to explain that, you know, if a place is growing huge um, onions for processing, they can't just turn around and put those onions into three pound bags for the grocery store. That, you know, it's akin to the uh, automobile manufacturers having to switch gears and start manufacturing um, ventilators, for example. So, you know, in terms of keeping your farm business healthy, uh, just like Ryan was saying, talk to your customers. Um, if you're not talking to them already, start talking to them this week. It's really going to make a difference in communication because the first person who maybe talks to them about a new opportunity is going to be the person who gets that opportunity. You know, so anything you can be doing to communicate, whether it's through your social media platforms or just direct emails or even telephone calls if you're smaller, um, it, it's going to be unhelpful. Um, Farm labor is going to be tight this year, even with massive unemployment. I think we all know that just because people are unemployed, they're not going to flock to jobs on farms anytime soon. Um, maybe some will. Maybe there will be some opportunities for worker share type situations to get some of the labor done. But I think it's wise to go into the year with the understanding that labor is going to be tight. Um, especially depending on how long this continues as far as uh, people getting diagnosed, will that further depress the amount of labor that's available? And my guess is, yeah, it will. I mean, we're seeing that with the places that are doing a lot of business right now, they're struggling to keep enough labor on hand. Um, researching possible things to do uh, in a labor situation that could be Tricky is, you know, looking at crops that require less labor, uh, looking at crops that are less perishable. If the markets are going to be uncertain, it's really hard to deal with crops that are highly perishable. If there is an opportunity to move towards things that are less perishable and you have storage capabilities, that's going to make a difference. So those are things to look into. You know, ideally crops that don't require packaging, since you might not have the labor to package, but if the only way that you can get something to market is to package it, then I think it's worth considering what it's going to take to package it too. Um, again, researching what it takes to do that in terms of labor and in terms of your marketing costs, but it's still something to think about. You know, try not to panic. I think we've I think at least we've kind of moved past the crisis management point a little bit and people are having a little longer term thought about what we're going to do here and how this is going to look going forward. Um, I would encourage people to really strongly think about any big changes in their business model that they decide to undertake. I, uh, Direct marketing is very expensive. It's not for everybody. Um, we work with some farms who are primarily wholesale and um, they're simply not set up to do um, direct marketing as are a lot of farmers of color and underserved community farmers. They're just not set up to do that kind of direct marketing. Um, you do need to understand what your costs are, whether it's the cost of a website for online ordering, whether it's the three or 4% that the online platform takes every time you process a credit card transaction. Um, do some research on that stuff. There's a lot of good things out there now about that. Um, so you shouldn't have any problem finding some of those resources. I have a couple more um, links I'll post into the chat. The, uh, the other danger I think is to do a bunch of things in crisis management mode that put you in a situation that you didn't intend to be in as a farmer. And whether that's doing home delivery, whether it's customizing your boxes, I mean, if it's the only way you can get something to market, then I think it's worth considering it. But the thing is, once we take on some of these practices, it's going to be really hard to walk them back. So once you start doing home deliveries, 
you're not going to keep that customer unless you continue delivering to their home. You know, so I think it's really important to think about, is this the kind of business I'm intending to be in? I want to grow produce, but maybe there are, if, if some of those things seem too insurmountable, then maybe it's time to think about, hey, maybe I need to look at wholesale or maybe I need to find other opportunities because I don't want to start something that just becomes, uh, you know, a um, <clears throat> millstone around my neck. Um, you know, and I think right now there's all this going on that I, I think it's easy to just think that we have to do so much about what we're doing this year, but I think it's really a good time to try to be thinking a little about beyond 2020 and what it's going to look like. We really don't know, but I think, again, thinking about your business model and thinking about making changes to it, in the short term, yeah, maybe that's what you have to do, but is that what you want to be doing in the long term and to really be taking that into account? Um, I'm going to paste a couple other resources in here. Um, you know, the U of M has quite a few resources on their COVID-19 page. Um, Cornell has a whole bunch of uh, items. You know, those of you who, who uh, look, look around for different information, there's a lot of good information coming out of New England too, you know, where there are smaller vegetable farms. And when you talk about helping farms, they mean talk, they're talking about helping specialty crop farms, not um, dairy, livestock, and cash crop farms. So it's good to look around for the information. Some, some of it coming out of Pennsylvania is really top notch. So I guess I'll just uh, sum it up there and say, make sure you're making good decisions as best as we all can in a crisis management type mode. Um, and yeah, I like Ryan's thing about hope. I mean, I think farming, putting a seed in the soil is the most hopeful, optimistic act that there is, you know? And I think, again, when you're talking to your customers or using your social media platforms, just putting that, putting that hope out there all the time, like so many of us already do, is just, is gonna be critical. And people really need to hear that right now. So I'll, that's all I got there, Natalie, so we can open it up. All right. Thank you both so much. So there, okay, so we do have one question to start. There's a lot of, there are a lot of comments in the chat, but they're pretty much all comments um, up till the end here. So Greg wants to know, are there any crops that will potentially be in short supply due to supply chain disruptions? Mm. Like if you put my, if I put my grocer hat on and just say, yeah, California, it's going to fall apart with this particular crop or something. Um, Melissa says pork. <laughs> yeah, that might be the case in the re very recent news. You know, nothing really comes to mind. I mean, we're always in kind of this competing alternative world, us versus the West Coast or something. I mean, I don't think that there's any kind of, I mean, a, a truck's coming from California, it isn't. And the broccoli's going to get grown regardless. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, do you have any sense of that, Dave? I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have any, like, yeah, this crop's going to be an issue. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I mind. think some of the protein stuff is definitely going on. But um, I know that you can't switch over and, you know, pick up the protein catalog and order your seed for it right now. So I, I think looking at, I think, highly perishable things, will probably just due to their nature of being perishable, will be in more short supply just because if there's a shortage of anything, it's gonna be something that has to make its way here quickly. Um, I think the storage things will be a little better served, but I, I think hopefully we'll see something about local um, storage crops being more prevalent in a wider range of grocery type retail outlets this year, but who knows. Yeah, it's a good point about perishable, non-perishable. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts. I mean, you're asking us to kind of divine what's going to be going on four or five months from now, which I think is tough. I'm going to stick to this point that I had at the beginning. If I were going to, if I were a betting person, and I'm kind of am betting on crops, I'm all about going long on staples. 
if if my assumption is that there's we're essentially going into a deeper recession that there is going to be some kind of economic hurt look we are in a recession proof kind of business as long as we're in staples i'm not going to go long on microgreens i'm going to go long on potatoes you know i mean all of us are sort of trying to as veggie people we're like yeah i got 30 some crops here should i go longer here and shorter here which way would you go well i think overall we're local we're going to I think, I think there's overall that point about David saying in terms of selling direct, hopefully that trend does stick. That's not a guaranteed thing. I kind of foresee that in the near future. But in terms of the mix of products, I guess I'm focusing on staples over specialty. I'm not going to go long on fennel this year. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So. Yeah, I totally agree. And then there's kind of a follow-up question here about um, prices are grocery store produce items going up in price. Um, is that changing? I don't know if anyone else gets the co-op partners warehouse newsletter, but I think it's fascinating. <laughs> it really kind of highlights the week to week changes like, Oh, it's raining in Washington this week. So like onions are still on the ground. So they're extra expensive. Oh, now they're, now they're back to normal again. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, I've, I watch it only because I'm more involved in the management of a food co-op than I'd ever thought I would be at this point in my life, but I'm watching that. And, and yeah, I mean, there's always these short-term blips yeah. back and forth. Broccoli goes up one week and down and up and down, but there isn't some overall trend as if produce across the board has all gotten 30% more expensive as somebody, my wife's actually the buyer for our co-op. So we sit around the kitchen table doing produce orders <laughs> after dinner. So it isn't like all across wholesales all gone up in that way. Um, we certainly heard of some price gouging in particular stores, uh, especially during panic buying, but that's, that's kind of a different story, I think, than uh, where the supply chain is setting produce prices at least. So this is a totally different question. I don't, I don't know that you two will this almost seems like more of a food safety question, but Mary asked about um, the power of produce club and EBT in, I think for farmers market settings um, and packaging. So like in a store produce is just kind of out in the open so people can be breathing on it potentially. Um, she understands bagging things like lettuce and spinach, but what about rhubarb, chard, et cetera? I don't know if there's, you have a more specific follow-up, Mary. Um, but. I, I guess my, my point may be a, we got to have a food safety person on here that could chime in. But, you know, my general sense is um, at least what I've seen so far, and I'm not, I'm not Mr. Food Safety Expert here, is that actually like uh, the, the virus will hold on uh, plastics and such longer than paper or cardboard. I mean, so this point Wait, about- Annalise is on here, right? <laughs> Annalise, to say something. I'm <laughs> swimming here. I don't really know what I'm yeah. saying. Um, yeah, so it, it has been shown to persist on uh, plastics two days, stainless steel up to three days. We don't know. We don't know about like softer plastics, like a bag. It it, it hasn't been tested on that, but it you could uh, say up to a day or two. The most important thing is <clears throat> to keep people away from each other because we know that is the primary route of transmission is when people are close to each other, breathe, spit, sneeze, cough on each other, and they inhale those particles. So on the produce itself, you know, you could, could potentially infect someone by sneezing on it and then they would put their hand into that goo that's on the produce and then get it into their eye uh, a lot less likely, but not impossible. Okay. Does that answer the question, Mary? If not, you could you can send a follow-up question with more specifics. Um, so Melissa wants to know, but Ryan, can you make money on staples? <laughs> well, yeah, sure. You can make money on staples. I don't see. Um, for myself, you know, what I've always found is my own, um, my own recipe for CSA, for example, is really geared towards staples. I say, I'm not like a, 
we're all specialty crop operators, right? But I try not to get too specialty. So uh, my CSA recipe is always 80% staples, 20% interesting stuff. The CSAs that I've seen come and go are ones that will fill up half the box with bok choy and everybody freaks out, right? So I think there's a lot to be said about staples. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're doing the most boring, let's get one step above the most staple of staples. <laughs> like if all we're doing are big boy tomatoes, well, we can do one step better than that and sprinkle in a few heirlooms. You know, I'm a direct marketing person, but I think that's sort of a winning mix because I'm not going long on such highly specialized things that I don't have a market, right? I, I, I guess that's my point. Maybe where you're serving a Twin Cities market, there you you can you can better reach a narrow niche of people if you're direct marketing. Whereas I'm here in you know Ottertail County, and I'm trying to serve kind of a wider berth of people. In which case, um, reasonably priced um, produce that's fresh, primarily staples. I don't know. It's worked for me for 16 years, so that's that's all I know. <laughs> All right, so a question from Caitlin is, as we make these decisions, how can we continue to build the food system, economy, community that we want to see? Any ways to make sure local sticks after the pandemic? And how do farmers of privilege support emerging growers who will be hit even harder during this time? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is a big concern of ours since, uh, you know, I work with a lot of farmers all over the, Twin Cities, you know, and I, you know, even I've just heard talk in the last few days about uh, Hmong farmers who are concerned about going to farmers markets because they're going to be discriminated against because this virus originated in China, which is shocking to even think that people put that together. But um, yeah, I think these are real things we need to think about. I think the Hmong farmers in particular are gonna be really hard hit by any decrease in farmers market traffic. Um, that's a huge part of how they're marketing right now. And I know Mill City's done some great work around helping farmers to get online ordering up and available. Um, but there's only so many farmers markets that have that level of support to be able to help growers like that. So I think it's really it's the farmers who are at the Elk River Farmers Market, or it's the farmers who are in Rosemount at the Farmers Market, you know, that, that are mostly volunteer run markets that I think um, we're gonna have to really figure out how to have some sort of safety net for. I don't know, I, you know, my take of this, this question about different camps of growers and, and, and how to have, um, the food system that that we imagine or, or want to have. Um, I don't know, maybe it's my personality, but at the end of the day, I always feel that this whole farming thing is 100% a very human endeavor. Um, and whether, whether we're native, Latino, white, what have you, I think it is about building a community of growers where we respect and know one another and respect and support one another, regardless. And um, I, I think people see that, right? I mean, there's a different, so I'll make a distinction between a community of growers and then just everybody else. Let's just call them all consumers or something. But I think the rest of the world sees how we as a community of growers interact and support one another. And I think part of that support, it isn't just saying, hey, I'm doing great, here's a check. I think part of it is, hey, I know you. I know you're a grower, I respect you as a grower. You, oh, you're looking, you're looking for pork? Oh, talk to this guy, talk to this person. If we know one another as growers, we can support one another as individual businesses. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 guess, I guess that's my take and much, we almost, I, I want to think about us as a community of growers in the same way that a bunch of merchants on Main Street can think about one another in terms of uh, supporting one another, knowing one another. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's where, where it really begins because for myself, 
you know, I'd, I'd take a bullet for some of my fellow growers. Uh, and that's, I, I, I hope it's uh, re reciprocal, if you will. Right. Um, I will say we are kind of brainstorming, putting together another local foods college session specifically about that. Like how, how can we address racism, um, especially at farmers markets at this time? How do we support growers who maybe are older or have limited English and who like can't just easily set up a website? Um, so yeah, that's coming together. We will be advertising that in the future. Um, but if, if any of you know of people who are doing innovative work and have good ideas, um, please do feel free to reach out. Um, okay, so another question here from Karen. Is there an opportunity to partner with other farms who are, who are already doing staples to add that value to the consumer or to the customer? Folks who are selling staples to restaurants, for example, would likely need new partners. Yeah, I, again, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we, we see some models of this. Um, you know, again, I think it's just coming down to building a very human relationship with your fellow growers. I mean, I was involved over 10 years ago selling to uh, a couple of nursing homes in Fergus Falls, and we just did that as a group of three growers. You know, I'm the point person, the sales person with the, the, the operation, but um, I was able to arrange those sales with those other, uh, from the product from those other two operators. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, in much the same way, we used to offer flower shares together with RCSA when we were delivering direct to home. Um, I mean, these, these are not insurmountable things. They're pretty simple things um, in large part because you just have to say, you know, what am I currently doing? How can I cooperate in a very tangible way with another operator? And oftentimes when we're already driving around the countryside delivering things, we're not actually taking on added cost. We're just, we're just adding product along uh, and, and, and getting it to the end customer uh, all the while building and forging a relationship uh, with another operator. It's, um, I don't know, to, to me, it just seems, it's, it's a pretty well, simple thing. Uh, at the end of the day, you're, you're going to do better by your customer as well. That's what I found. But, yeah, yeah, and I don't think that uh, we have to limit it to farmers because small businesses all over this country are going to be in trouble. You know, we already see restaurants that are still open for takeout also starting to offer groceries. You know, <laughs> if you're coming there to pick something up, you might as well come there to pick up other things. You know, so I think... If you were someone who was heavily into marketing to restaurants, you could be talking to those restaurant owners about that. Yeah, breweries too, as Swan says. I, I mean, I think there are opportunities like that where it's like, okay, this is an alternative to a grocery store. People are getting their toilet paper from a restaurant. Um, what else could we do? You know, <laughs> it's kind of a, a circumvention of the whole retail system and the supply chain. But I think, what the heck, it's kind of a, a, a wild west to try some of that. Well, I, I, there I are some that, basic right, um, considerations when you're starting to, you're basically starting to aggregate at that point um, in terms of like the types of licenses you need and whatnot. It's not that complicated, um, but good to kind of look into that. I just posted in the chat um, one of an article from our fruit and veg blog um, where Jane Jewett helped us to kind of do a really basic overview of like, if you're going to be working with farms to do deliveries together or something, what are some of the really basic things that you should be aware of from a legal standpoint or a regulatory standpoint? Yeah. But I, I do want to underline your point there, Dave. I think it's absolutely right. The, this wild west is a point I was trying to get at about people are now at this place of alternative procurement, <laughs> right? Alternative procurement is now becoming non-alternative. Like it's, um, get creative in, in, in how that's done. If I were gonna go back in time, um, my younger sustainable egg self when I was 22 and working with Paul and Chris Burkhouse across the river from you, the conversation in the sustainable egg community was usually around this term that I think we've dropped over the years called the alternative local economy. Uh, that's a phrase I use a lot when I was in my younger, my young 20s. <laughs> 
And over time, as we've grown in sustainable ag community, I don't hear that language as much. But that's exactly what we're talking about right here. Uh, a partnership between farms and other businesses that get a valuable product into the hands of people that appreciate it. That's really what it comes down to. So in terms of business development, that's it. And it does seem, from my point of view, that there is a real, I mean, again, if, if the entire food system almost comes to a screeching halt in a week, it really gives people pause, doesn't it? And they say, mm, I don't know. I have my doubts about this thing. And I'm not saying we should just have doubts about the entire food system, but it causes people to kind of rethink some th things. Um, and I think there's an appetite uh, to engage in those alternatives in a way that might have seemed almost not really all that possible right now. I mean, my, my, my own point is uh, I'm right now in the, the midst with our, our food co-op of trying to run a capital campaign, of trying to raise $400,000. Sounds like the world's worst timed ca capital campaign ever, correct? Um, but at least in these early days, there's actually been pretty good response. Why? I think because of what I just said. There's an appetite to say, oh my goodness, um, is there something we need, to, we need to do? We need to rethink this food system thing. Or I need to rethink how I'm, I'm sourcing uh, my, food, my food as a customer. And so um, it's that thing that like foods become more important than it ever has been. And there's a greater appetite for these alternative ways. And people are looking to support that in a way. We need to capitalize that and be creative to capitalize on that. I, that's my own take anyways. Yeah. Brian just yammering again, sorry. All right, back to you, Natalie. Sorry for <laughs> that, that, that distraction I went on that, that soliloquy. Um, all right, do we have any additional questions? Ms. Annalise is just reiterating, even though we know that there are no known cases of COVID-19 illness via food or food packaging, it seems like a good idea for farmers to be very transparent. Talk to customers up front about basic sanitation and steps um, that we do to reduce transmission of the illness. Customers will be very happy to hear what you're doing. All right, are there any additional questions you know just on that a little bit too natalie i think one interesting thing that you know some people have touched on is that the farmers are doing a whole lot of work to try and figure out how to make this work as our farmers markets and you go into a grocery store and they're not doing anything you know it looks i mean okay spacing out people and not letting people in but otherwise the produce section in the grocery store for the most part looks pretty similar to the what how it did eight weeks ago you know so i think yeah communicating with people about what you're doing and the precautions you're taking is i think way important to get out ahead on yeah i think there's a pretty wide spectrum of grocery stores some are definitely going above and beyond um but yeah any the more we know, the better we're going to feel about it. So, yeah. All right, no more hard questions. All right. Um, also reiterating many times that this is not a foodborne illness. <laughs> okay. All right, well, if there are no more questions, um, I have just two extra slides here for two additional slides. Um, let me just figure out how to share this real quick. All right, sorry. Whoops. Okay, so um, just to reiterate, actually, I'll go back to this one. So we will continue to have local foods college sessions. All of them are Tuesdays and Thursdays from 3 to 4 30. Um, this Thursday, Helen from MDA and Carly from the Minnesota Grocers Association are going to talk about wholesale response um, for folks who have lost markets. Next week, um, Ren and Kathy from RSCP are going to talk about their farm to rural grocery work um, and the toolkit they just came out with. 
following Thursday, Rachel Armstrong from Farm Commons will talk about um, employment concerns and some of the legal implications of employment decisions that people are making in response to COVID. Um, and then we'll have some more um, coming up after that as well, based on your feedback. So if you would like to follow the local foods college on Facebook or Twitter, you can do that. Um, and otherwise, the local foods college website is at z.umn.edu slash local foods college. All of these are recorded. And so if you want to go back and look at previous sessions, um, you can watch those. And that's it. So thanks for joining us. Thanks.